Okay. Well, uh, thanks for coming. I'm Baron Soka. I'm president of Tech Freedom. Uh, this is our first event on COPPA in five years, so thanks for, for coming today. Uh, and please do silence your phones. I believe we have uh, Wi-Fi. I don't know the login info, but yes, Wi-Fi. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll be tweeting on the COPPA hashtag. So please uh, feel free to join in the conversation. So uh, my colleague Jim Dunson is going to moderate today. Jim joined us recently as our general counsel, in case you don't know that. He uh, has been an adjunct fellow at Tech Freedom for the last eight years since we started and has been practicing telecom and FTC and COPPA law um, for 35 years. The Wi-Fi uh, network is AIA, the uh, American Institute for Architecture, DC, UNF. You probably see that. And the password is, uh, well, it's kind of complicated. It's, <laughs> it, it's capital A, architect, but with a C, an S at the end instead of a T. Architects <laughs> underscore 20, 2014. Yeah, that's not so easy. Uh, anyway, this is a great space. This is kind of our default space downtown. We did our big conference here last year, so we're happy to be here again. It's a, a beautiful space created by some very thoughtful architects. Anyway, uh, before Jim takes over the panel, uh, we're going to have um, Manisha uh, Mithil from the uh, Federal Trade Commission do an intro to COPPA. So I just wanted to say a few words about her background so you know who she is and how delighted we are to have her. Uh, she's been at the commission since 1999, practiced law before that, and is currently the associate director of the FTC's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, better known as DPIP, which you might hear referred to today. Uh, in addition to COPPA, the uh, subject of today's discussion, she's managed a number of other significant initiatives, including the FTC's report on big data, the data broker industry, the Internet of Things, consumer privacy, facial recognition, and mobile privacy disclosures. Were there any big reports you, on privacy you didn't manage? <laughs> no? Okay. So she's really Mrs. Privacy for the moment, and we're delighted to have her. And um, she's going to give us a, an overview of COPPA and what the FTC has been doing, and then Jim will lead our panel discussion with some um, very distinguished experts on the subject. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Baron. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and so I, I think this is probably a useful exercise just to level set and make sure that uh, people have the lay of the land on kind of the history of COPPA, who it covers, um, and what its requirements are. So I'll just cover those three topics quickly and talk a little bit about some recent activities at the FTC. Um, so in terms of the history of COPPA, very briefly, Congress enacted COPPA um, in 1998, um, and the original uh, act simply and basically required that uh, websites and online services get verifiable parental consent before collecting information from children under 13. Um, so, um, so that uh, that uh, law uh, was implemented into a rule. The, uh, the law gave the FTC rulemaking authority along with the authority to seek civil penalties for violations. The FTC issued its rule in 2000, 2000, 2000. Um, and, um, and began enforcing uh, COPPA, brought a number of enforcement actions. And so then around 2009-2010 uh, timeframe, uh, led by my wonderful um, friend to my left, Phyllis Marcus, um, the FTC began re-examining the um, the COPPA rule. Um, so what the FTC had observed was there was a rise in um, uh, mobile apps directed to kids. There was a rise in social media. Um, and some of these things hadn't been um, around at the time the original COPPA law was enacted. Um, so the FTC held workshops and did a uh, proposed, uh, uh, did a rulemaking um, that um, sought comment on kind of whether changes to COPPA were necessary in light of these new developments in the marketplace. Um, and then uh, in, in 2012, the commission finalized a revised rule that became effective in 2013. Um, so, so that is the kind of uh, brief history. And um, I will, uh, I guess the next topic is kind of who is subject to COPPA. So as I mentioned, it's websites and online services. And there's three categories of entities that are subject to COPPA. Um, the first is uh, websites or online services directed to kids. Um, and um, how do we determine when a website or online service is directed to kids? There's a number of factors we look at, um, including subject matter, content, 
presence of animated characters, age of models, presence of celebrities um, that are appealing to kids, evidence about the intended audience of the website or online service, um, and any other empirical evidence about the um, audience of the website or online service. So that's the first kind of category of uh, uh, websites and online services uh, that, co that are covered by CABA. Those are the directed to kids. The second category is those general audience websites or online services that have actual knowledge uh, that there are children or there's a child on their site. And you can gain actual knowledge in a number of ways. Uh, for example, if you ask for an age or a birth date um, or something like that, you can also gain actual knowledge if you get complaints from parents. Um, and then the, um, the 2012, uh, 2013 rule added a new category of entities that were subject to COPPA, um, and these are kind of third-party plugins, ad networks that operate on first-party sites. And so the rule is basically that if you have actual knowledge that the first party is directed to kids, then you also are subject to COPPA and you must comply with it. So, um, so you, uh, let's say you know that you are on an app that's directed to kids and you're an ad network, um, then you also have to um, make sure that you get a verifiable parental consent before collecting uh, personal information online. And I'll talk about what personal information is in a minute. Actually, I'll talk about it now. <laughs> um, so, um, so okay. So, so personal information. What is personal information? Um, so, uh, there's the traditional categories of personal information, kind of traditional name, contact information, social security number. Um, but then the uh, the COPPA rule in 2013 added additional uh, categories of personal information. Uh, and let me just mention a couple. One is photos, videos, audio files. Again, th that wasn't really contemplated that websites and online services would collect that back in 2000, but obviously with the increase of uh, social media and other types of sites, that's being collected more often. So photos, videos, audio, geolocation information uh, that is precise enough to identify street name and city or town. Um, persistent identifiers, um, and uh, there are some exclusions. So, so persistent identifiers only considered personal information if it is used to track uh, children uh, across websites and over time, um, and it is not considered personal information it's only, if it's only being used for certain um, operational purposes or support for the internal operations of the site, and that includes things like um, analytics or fraud prevention, um, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of keeping a user's name uh, or place within a game, that sort of thing. Um, so um, so that, that's kind of what personal information is. Um, and, then, and then finally, just in terms of the requirements under COPPA, um, that once it's determined that you're a website or online service that's covered by COPPA, that's collecting personal information from children, uh, there's several requirements that you must satisfy. You have to have a privacy policy. You have to provide direct notice to parents uh, about your collection of information from children. You have to get their verifiable parental consent. You have to make sure you have reasonable security, and you have to provide parents with the right to delete information, and you can no longer, um, you have to uh, delete information once there's no longer a business need for that information, even if a parent doesn't request deletion. Um, so, so that's a very quick overview of the requirements of COPPA. Um, in terms of the FTC activities, we've brought uh, close to 30 cases um, involving COPPA, um, ranging from websites directed to kids to websites with actual knowledge to apps. Um, and, um, and just to give you a couple of recent examples, um, after the 2013 rule was implemented, we brought our first case uh, involving collection of persistent identifier against two mobile apps that were using those uh, persistent identifiers for behavioral advertising called LAI and Retro Dreamer. Um, then a couple of years ago, we brought our first case against one of those third parties that was collecting information from a first party. And this is an interesting case called InMobi. Um, and InMobi was basically a third party ad network. And they were um, collecting geolocation information, including from children's apps. And what's interesting is that even for even if a, a, a user declined to have geolocation information collected, they were using other technological methods to recreate the precise geolocation information. Um, and we allege that they violated COPPA because they actually knew there was a, there was a flag that they had where uh, uh, apps could uh, designate their sites as kid-directed, and even on those sites they were collecting this information. So we allege that they violated COPPA. 
Um, and then finally, I will just mention a case we brought earlier this year against VTech. Uh, this is what we consider to be our first connected toy case. Um, so VTech sells uh, laptops uh, and, and phones and other um, devices directed to kids. Uh, they have apps that we alleged were uh, directed to kids, and we allege that they didn't get verifiable parental consent and provide um, all the notices required under COPPA. They also experienced a data breach, and we allege that they didn't have reasonable security under COPPA. So, again, that was just a really quick flyby. I don't know if my co-panelists have anything to add. They know as much, if not more, about COPPA than I do. So, um, anything to add, Sarah, Phyllis, Jim? Um, one thing I will say uh, as Manisha mentioned, the act was enacted in 1998, and it was a rare instance of quick congressional action after the FTC had identified a need. I think the FTC testified to issues relating to children's online privacy in June of 1998. Um, there may have been a report that came out from the FTC simultaneously, but by October, there was a law in place. So in warp speed, four months. Hard to imagine. These <laughs> with, with no opposition, yeah. and the law has never been challenged, and it's never been retracted, and it has kind of stood the test of time. So here we are 20 years out um, with a bi rare example of bipartisan coming together um, and kind of a, a solid showing. All right, thank you, Manisha. Thank you, um, Phyllis. So now we're going to take like a really deep dive into some of the issues that Manisha talked about. And so I'd like to begin with the panelists introducing themselves. And what we like to do with panels like this is sort of tell us how you got into COPPA and what your history with COPPA is. I, I don't think, Manisha, you don't have to do it again. You've been, you've been introduced. But Phyllis, let's start with, with you. Kind of how did you find your way into COPPA? Oh, my gosh. It's kind of a funny story. <laughs> um, I had been at the FTC for a number of years, always in consumer protection. Um, I was winding down in a particular position and looking for the next fun thing. And so I ended up in the Division of Advertising Practices, which at the time was responsible for enforcing the COPPA rule, primarily because that is the division. It's a small agency, but there are a number of divisions and hierarchies. And that was the division that was vested with looking at children's issues overall. And so children's privacy was considered to be a part of the children's program and actually predated the privacy division, which was created during the time that I was at the FTC. And so it came along um, at the right time, and social networking had really hit the scene in a big way. And so um, an otherwise somewhat dormant enforcement program kind of just you know, hit us in the face and someone said to me, we've got this investigation, go for it. Um, and so I... Um, helped to grow the COPPA program. I had a wonderful partner in crime named Mamie Cressis, who many of you know. And Mamie and I um, had a really great time for seven or, years. Or Famie, as you were right. called with me, <laughs> FTC. <laughs> Just like Brangelina. <laughs> there we were. Um, and, and Mamie and I, um, what we inherited was, I thought, a very good example of something that the government can do right. Um, in fact, I had asked my supervisor, Mary Engel, at the time whether we should continue with an open door policy. We had a hotline. Anyone could could call us, um, and people did all the time, attorneys working at law firms, because the, the rule, while small and unchallenged, is complicated, and the issues that of implementation are complicated, and we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, so people could call us, um, you know, for free, unattributed, and we would help walk attorneys and operators through. We had um, FAQs up that we would update periodically, and we would do a healthy dose of enforcement. And so it really was kind of the anti-Alzheimer's, um, I called it the anti-Alzheimer's program, because you just kind of had to wrap your head around really complicated issues. Um, the FTC had launched an initiative into mobile privacy, and out of that initiative, there were several deliverables, one of which was this idea that we would review the COPPA rule after it had been implemented and enforced for a number of years. And so we launched a two-year 
initiative. We had workshops, as Manisha said. We put out a revised proposed rule. We re-revised that. You know, this was a fast-moving target. And then we issued um, the rule that went into effect in July of 2013, at which time Amy and I were a little bit done, um, needed to just kind of refresh with other issues. And it made sense at that point to turn the COPPA program over to the privacy division, um, which should serve as a clearinghouse for all the privacy initiatives. And that's when that's when Manisha took over. And then um, subsequent to that, I went on to do other things. And then I left the FTC. So I'm no longer there. And that is my history with COP in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks, Phyllis. Um, Sarah Cluck, introduce yourself, how you got into this, and where you are now. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I uh, do not have quite as long of a history with COPPA as um, the other folks on this panel. I started working on COPPA issues in 2011 when I had just left Capitol Hill and started working at a trade association, um, which is now known as Act the App Association, working with members that, are, that were trying to figure out how to comply with children's privacy laws. Um, so so I remember one of my very first days at ACT, I got, we got a letter from Senator Rockefeller saying, what are you doing on children's privacy? And we were like, oh, we should probably figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, and then that kicked off working um, with our members and working with the Federal Trade Commission and figuring out how we were complying with um, children's privacy laws and how the children's privacy law COPPA would look in the future. Um, so we participated in the rulemaking process, submitted comments, um, had some fun back and forth with the Federal Trade Commission, um, and eventually um, when the new rule went into effect, launched a program um, which was then known as Know What's Inside, um, which was a compliance program intended to help small app developers learn how to comply with the with COPPA. Um, and it was sort of a checklist um, because a lot of the independent app developers at that time um, were just that, independent app, app developers, moms and dads and teachers making apps for kids to help them learn how to spell. Uh, they didn't, they weren't thinking about it necessarily from a business perspective. Um, primarily, they were thinking about it, how can I help my kids um, learn to read a little bit better. Uh, so we came up with this checklist to help them get the low level compliance correct. Um, and at its height, I think we had around 400 apps participating in the program um, at its height. Um, and then after, after uh, we got that program off the ground, I left and went to work at the Department of Education on a fellowship working in the privacy office, helping um, the privacy office navigate how EdTech and FERPA interacted. FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, um, and how, um, how education technology companies used in the classroom can pl comply with those laws. COPPA also impacts that, so we spent a lot of time thinking about the intersection of COPPA and FERPA um, while I was there. And now I am at um, the Software and Information Industry Association as our Director of Education Policy, um, working with our education technology companies and helping them figure out what it means to comply with both FERPA and COPPA and all of the hundreds of state privacy laws that are, they are impacted by. Great. Thanks, Baron. Uh, I remember basically three things from my internet law class in 2002. Uh, the first is uh, eBay versus Bitter's Edge, which is the trespass to chattels case that will amuse lawyers endlessly, for sure. I see you're all very amused. Uh, second was my, my professor, um, little uh, unknown uh, at the time legal academic named Tim Wu, was writing a paper about net neutrality, which I didn't realize would end up taking up the next... Um, let's see, 17 years of my life, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And the third was, was COPPA, because that was fairly new at the time. The rule had just been um, issued. And, uh, and it was even then, it was, was quite fascinating. I had no idea that that would be one of the things that I um, ended up focusing on. So I did some COPPA work in private practice. And then when I left in 2008 to join the Progress and Freedom Foundation uh, and started to work with Adam Thier, who had worked on First Amendment issues for a long time, uh, that actually became a very obvious focus for us because uh, there was uh, an effort to reassess COPPA. There were lots of questions being asked about it at the time. And I understood COPPA and still do as being not um, the, the first uh, effort by the uh, Congress to try to protect children online, but the third. 
Um, the Communications Decency Act in 1996, of course, uh, failed uh, completely in court, other than the uh, Section 230, which still stands. Uh, the second, um, COPA, the Child Online Protection Act, uh, was also struck down in court for essentially um, limiting access to material that might be uh, considered offensive uh, or, or harmful to children. And the third is, is COPPA. Congress, on the third time, finally, in a sense, got it right, did something that has not been challenged and has, has in that sense, uh, is still with us. And so all of my work has really been focused on, on understanding um, COPPA's place as striking a very careful balance um, between uh, free speech rights of adults, principally, uh, but also of children, and, and recognizing that the directed at analysis, as uh, arcane as that may seem, was really the only way, and I think is still the only way, to, um, to, to try to age segregate a certain category of content. And uh, my, the main point of our COPPA 2.0 paper back in, in uh, 2008 was really that, that that test works well enough. Uh, it will not work for older children for reasons we can talk about, and that one should be very careful of trying to push COPPA beyond what it was originally intended to do, which I think, again, was very carefully uh, crafted back in a time when Congress was actually capable of crafting legislation. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Baron. Uh, again, I'm Jim Dunstan. I, I serve as general counsel at Tech Freedom. I've also been in private practice for 35 years. I've had a very interesting and eclectic mix of work that I do, I do which includes uh, media, television, um, as well as computer game. Um, and I'm also distinctly strange and that I'm also a software engineer. Um, and so I've actually had my clients send me their code on age gating so I could break it or unbreak it for them. Um, and so I've, I've really been in the, you know, sort of the trenches of this for, for a lot of years. Uh, I have enough gray hair to, to say that not only have I been around since COPPA, I've actually been around since the dawn of the internet. Um, I did work for Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, the true fathers of the, the, the internet, not Al Gore, um, and was in the room when the World Wide Web was was first publicly displayed, um, and some very interesting, you know, discussions over the years with those two who really, you know, are the pioneers behind it. Um, and even back then, we talked about the need for for, for protection of, of kids. Um, so, I, I, with that, I kind of want to start with the fact that we're at 20, you know, 20 years old with with a cop, and I think it is worth doing just stopping for a second and saying what was the state of the internet in 1998 when Congress passed this? It's really important because back then you essentially had static web pages or web pages that had fillable forms in it um, and so COPPA compliance was fairly easy. You could age gate with software, you could make sure that you didn't collect information. You know that's all changed now. We've got apps, we've got highly interactive, we've got, we've got cloud, we've got all these different uh, services that we provide and so the internet is a very different place. The second thing that's really different um, is the fact that we've now got these gigantic social media sites, and we've talked about that, who, who congregate content but don't necessarily curate it. And, and so the question of how COPPA applies to them, I think, is sort of what we have to look at next. And now we've got the Internet of Things. We've got talking toys. We've got things that are plugged in, you know, the, the, the age-old question about, about is my toast ready yet? Um, and, and so, well, if that toast was put in by a 12-year-old, do we have to worry about whether my, my toast is ready? Um, and, and finally, the other thing that is so fascinating is, again, if you go back to 1998, you're talking about static pages delivered to personal computers. Um, that was the dominant state of the internet. Well, we've now got smartphones, cat tablets, we've got all these different devices. The requirements for the network interactivity are far different. When I was coding you know, HTML 2.0, all I had to do was worry about was three or four different screen resolutions and make sure that, that, that you know, my page developed now. Now we've got multiple operating systems on, on different devices. And so the requirements of the network to make sure that the content is delivered correctly is far greater than it was back in 1998. And so operators are finding themselves sort of inadvertently collecting a lot of information. And, and as many just talked about, the definition of PII itself has expanded. And so we've got to think about that. The other thing we have to think about is how Content is now consumed by children, so, so very different than it was in 1998. Again, personal computer that, you, that the parents sat over the child's shoulder and, and could curate, could manage. You know, the tablet has basically become the de facto nanny in the house. Now, I have a three-year-old grandchild, and my daughter, you know, who has a PhD in early childhood development, you know, 
sends Colton to the, you know, to the tablet and, and to do stuff. And I, I'm like, wow, aren't you worried? Well, she curates and she, you know, maintains. Um, but it's a very different world than, than it was, was back then. Um, and, and so when we talk about these issues, especially issues going forward, we've got to recognize the, tech, the severe technological change. Um, and and the ch what that change has done is make compliance with COPPA a lot more difficult, I think. And, I, and that's the first question I want to throw to the panel is how has the change in the Internet changed how we view COPPA and how we view COPPA compliance? Let me just say yeah. one word here. So just remember that the FTC has general authority, the Section 5, which is really technologically agnostic, right? Which is intended, and Congress put this very well in the 1980 Unfairness Policy Statement, to allow the Commission to, to keep up with new uh, practices that might be harmful to consumers without having to, for, without Congress having to be more specific. So the way to think about COPPA is that Congress was more specific. Congress attempted to deal with a specific problem with a specific framework based on a specific set of circumstances, and that's inherently more difficult to apply over time than is Section 5. So the question then is, do, how well do the moving parts of that framework hold up today? I can start. Um, so so I, think, I, I think a couple of answers. So, so first, I think when Congress is enacting a specific statute in a specific area, I, I do think that that is where rulemaking authority is helpful, uh, the APA rulemaking authority. So kind of for those who aren't FTC watchers, mm -hmm. we have this for Section 5, unfair, deceptive, we have this other form of rulemaking called rulemaking under Magnuson Moss, which requires a multi-year process of hearings and transcripts and cross-examinations. And we don't have the streamlined APA rulemaking procedures that other agencies have. But when we have a specific statute, I think uh, the lesson from COPPA is, and Congress gives us authority to, to make rules under APA, we will use that authority to make sure that um, that the rule keeps up over time. And so, you know, we issued the first rule in 2000 and another rule in 2013. Now, I'm not saying that that's, that's kind of the be-all, end-all because rulemaking takes time too. Um, but I, you know, I, I think this is this is a little bit of an age-old debate. Um, so, you know, every couple of years there's something new. I think um, Jim mentioned, you know, so in the mid 2000s, we, you know, well, in the mid 90s, we had the internet. Mid 2000s, we had oh now mobile technology. Everybody's walking around with you know geolocation information in their pockets, and then and now we have Internet of Things, and um, and I do think that we are involved in a constant process of kind of uh, trying to keep up with the technology, trying to make sure that the rules still make sense. And just to give an example, um, uh, we just issued an enforcement policy statement on audio recordings. Um, and so uh, when we uh, enacted the 2013 amendments, we said audio recordings of a kid's voice are covered as personal information under the rule. So now fast forward a couple of years and we see, you know, a lot of devices that uh, the Alexas and the, um, and the Google Home devices and others that, um, that are getting information, the voice commands, voices almost replace typing in for search. And so we said, you know, that, that's not really what, um, what we intended to cover in the rule. And so we issued an enforcement policy statement making it clear that we wouldn't enforce if you're simply collecting the audio to effectuate a command and then deleting the audio and using it for no other purpose. Um, and so I think that's an example of how we try to keep up with changes in the marketplace. Um, and, uh, and, and it is difficult and it is challenging, but I think that on balance, um, you know, the, the, the law and the rule has been successful. And, um, and, uh, and I think that as long as the agency has delegated certain authority to conduct rulemakings and to, um, and to keep, keep pace with the times, I think we can use those tools wisely. Uh, so I, and I, I, I really appreciate that because I think companies are always, companies look to the FTC at, for guidance and for help when they're, when these new technologies, when they're thinking about these new technologies, no company ever is going to say, how are we going to take advantage of this and take all of this kid's information and do something bad with it? Um, they're trying to figure out how to work within the bounds of what the FTC has established. And if it's not there, then it's really hard to figure out. But when the FTC issues those sorts of statements, then they can say, okay, that's how they're thinking. Let's figure out how to build within that. And I, I have a bit of a follow-up question to what you said. Um, and maybe it's diving kind of right in. There are a couple of different ways that the FTC can flag for industry. They're thinking on this particular rule. 
Um, and I, I wonder if you could put out for us a yeah. bit of a spectrum, because, you know, I know what led to the rule review. Prior to the rule review, um, those of us who were enforcing COPPA and working with businesses to provide guidance in the background were kind of aggregating a whole set of questions that were coming in from industry. And as kind of an intermediate step, we would periodically update what are called the FAQs, and that's just just additional business guidance based on kind of a collection of thinking where we thought, hmm, the FAQs aren't as um, precise as they could be. We're hearing a lot of questions in this area. And in a pretty informal process, we'd update them. Then when we got a more critical mass and it made sense, we decided maybe having a workshop, thinking through whether to update the rule itself would make sense. Then you've got articulations through cases. Um, which is somewhat on the back end, maybe arguably the tail wagging the dog. So you've got, you've got a lot of different moving parts. How do you lay all of those out? You know, we're five years out from the revised rule. Arguably five years from now, there could be another look back. The FAQs haven't been updated in a while. Um, so is there informal rulemaking, more formal rulemaking? And yeah. What, so, how do you guys balance So, so let me just answer that question with kind of, two parts. I think there's the kind of what are the inputs and kind of what are the potential outputs from the FTC. So in terms of the inputs, um, I think you had mentioned this earlier, Phyllis. I think COPPA is one area where uh, we have lots of mechanisms to get input from the public. So we have a hotline. Um, we have kind of a website box where people can come through and ask questions. You know, we have companies coming to us all the time and trade associations saying, hey, you know, we want to inform you of updates in our industry. We have lawyers who call that say, I don't want to tell you who my client is, but here's the scenario. Um, and so, um, so we do kind of, I think COPPA is an area where we do take a lot of uh, input from the public informally. Um, so then we take all that input and we say, okay, um, you know, here's an issue that we need to think about, you know, not only answering the specific question raised by the company. I guess another input is things, events like these, we, we, where we speak to trade associations or we speak to public groups and get questions from, from events. Um, and they get us thinking. And so we say, okay, well, you know, now we've provided the, the answer to this company or, or to this lawyer. How do we get that out to the public? Or it's, been, it's coming up, you know, in a lot of different contexts. How do we get, out, get that out to the public? And so I think there's a number of ways we do that. So one is the kind of um, update to the FAQs. Um, another is blog posts. So we recently put out a blog post on kind of deletion and data retention. Um, another is, hey, you know, these questions are coming up and over and over. Maybe we should have a workshop. And that's what we did in the ed tech area. Um, so we had a workshop last year on student privacy intersection between COPPA and FERPA. Um, and then, um, and then uh, the other one is... Um, is, is, is a rule, is, but up to rule reviews, the enforcement policy statement. That's the one I was right. So there's the enforcement policy statement. So we do that. And then, you know, the, another step could be kind of reopening the rules. So I think there's a lot of mechanisms to kind of to get out to the public what we've gotten from the inputs. Yeah, so I, I think about this a lot. I mean, most of our work at Tech Freedom is really about this problem of, of how regulators deal with uncertain technological uh, futures and the discretion that's afforded to them and how they, how they deal with that. So let me break this, what you just said, I think, into three pieces. So the first piece is how well does an agency listen? And I think COPPA is an agency where it's hard to imagine the commission doing any better a job of listening for all the reasons you both mentioned and, and bo through both throughout the entire experience that I've had with the agency that's certainly been true. The second is how well does the commission um, articulate what it's doing, what, what kind of guidance is it is it giving? Uh, clearly there's more that could be done. The, guidelines, the, excuse me, the FAQs have not been updated in quite some time. Um, there have been instances, and Jim can talk about this, where the, the process by which the FAQs were updated was itself a little surprising. You know, there's, so there's, there's a degree of predictability there that one, one would hope for. But there's, then there's a third thing. So if the second is, is how much does the commission say, um, and maybe even how specific is it, the, the third thing is more like how, how, how predictable is, is the agency versus how much, how much discretion is the commission still giving itself? And I think that's, that's where, in general, one might have a greater concern that the commission is, is um, no matter how much it says, no matter how well it listens, still is, is keeping a pretty, its options pretty wide open. And, 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 and to start with, I don't think that's the commission's fault in, in, in one important sense. I think the statute itself 
the way that Congress drafted it um, created a lot of discretion. And, and for example, we talked about the update to uh, that, that was done, and the main thing that was that the update was based upon was the the language in the statute. Where if you if you were to go back and and you know knowing what we know now and and ask members of Congress back in 1998 what they expected would happen, there's one sentence or one clause in the, in the original statute that I would point them to, which is the, in the definition of personal information. Because everyone who knows anything about privacy law knows that everything starts with that and then you build forward from that. And the commission was given uh, a very specific set of things that were considered to be personal information. So it's, and I'll just read this because I think it's helpful to understand the context. Uh, personal information means individually identifiable information about an individual collected online, including first and last name, home or physical address, including street name or, or name of city or town, an email address, a telephone number, a social security number, all makes sense. And then there are two more things. Any other identifier that the commission determines permits the physical or online contacting of a specific individual, and then the final catch-all is just anything you combine with those previous categories. Well, that, that second to last category, that category F, I, don't, I would love to know what people thought at the time. I've gone back and looked at the legislative history, and, and clearly a lot of the concern was about was physical contacting, was you know about the potential for abduction. It was a very real concern, a very real government interest in a First Amendment analysis that will win you know, every day, because that, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen to the child. But then the term online contacting, that was left in the statute open-ended. Now, I, I would argue that I think Congress was really concerned with um, the kinds of contacting of children that could really lead to more serious harms. But it's not specified. It was left open. And the commission has interpreted that to mean essentially anything that could allow any degree of, of targeting of message to a child. And that's a sense in which COPPA, I think, has been expanded pretty far beyond what I think people in 1998 really understood that it was intended to do, and that brings me back to my, my point about those three categories. In that sense, the statute you know, has, the, has, has grown and has the potential to, to grow still further based on that seemingly small ambiguity in the statutory text. Can I, let me kind of uh, respond. Um, so let me first respond to the legislative history point. So, um, so Baron, I and I haven't looked at it recently, but but from when I've looked at the legis legislative history, it seems clear to me that Congress was absolutely concerned about predators and people reaching out to kids to um, you know abduct them and, and that sort of thing. But there is some legislative history suggesting they're also concerned about marketing. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I think there was a lot of controversy surrounding the persistent identifier addition um, in the rule in uh, 2012 and 2013, which Phyllis can speak to more. But you know, certainly in, in, in 1998, you know, the way that marketing messages were being conveyed, maybe more through email addresses, more through websites, you know, website messages, whereas that same marketing to kids was happening through behavioral advertising in 2012, 2013. And so I think. Um, the the amendments, you know, were, were simply updating the rule in light of the congressional intent, intent to make sure that parents were in control over the marketing messages that their kids received. So, so I, so I read the legislative history a little bit more expansively than, than you might. I don't, I don't think you're wrong. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying it's it's yeah. it is broad. And and I and, and my personal view is that certainly kind of. The, the online the contact by predators is certainly a bigger harm that we need to be you know very vigilant about. Um, so, um, so 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 that that that, that was my, uh, what I want to say in response to the congressional point. And I, I in terms of the predictability point and the lack of updates to FAQs. Now I, I agree with you. I think that there's that we can always do better. But just by way of explanation, um, I think that, you know just partly the reason that there haven't been more recent updates to the FAQs. Um, you know, again, at the time of the 2013 rule, we were getting a lot of FAQs, frequently asked questions about similar topics. So topics that kept coming up over and over again. And I will say, just anecdotally, in the last couple of years, that has, has died down a little bit um, in terms of kind of getting a bunch of questions. So, so if you look at the 2013, 14, 15 timeframe, we did do a couple of updates to the FAQs, um, but we haven't seen that kind of um, the same level of questions from the public that we saw then. Um, I think the areas where we do see questions from the public, things like um, ed tech, where we had a workshop, 
or the um, enforcement, the the voice recordings. Um, you know, the voice recordings is an interesting thing because I don't think staff could do that through an FAQ because what we what the commission did through the enforcement policy statement in some ways conflicts with the language of the rule. And so only the commission could do that. So, so again, we take you know, each set of questions as they are and we say, does it make sense to do an update to an FAQ? Does it make sense to do a workshop? Does it make sense to do something else? And, and the other input I forgot to mention in, my, in response to my last question is, you know, as Phyllis mentioned, we do, we do have a lot of enforcement activity. And so the public sees the cases we bring and that provides some educational messages and guidance for the industry. But we also close several cases. So we look at a lot of COPPA cases and we close. And, Every time we close a case, we say, you know, is there an educational message? Is there a guidance message? Or is it just the company wasn't doing what we thought they were doing? If it's the latter, it's not really ripe for an FAQ. But uh, so, so I think that's part of the thought process, just to kind of make that clear. Um, but, but I don't disagree with you that, you know, we should be striving to do better in and, terms and of public just guidance. Just to avoid being misunderstood, yeah. I'm not really criticizing the commission. What I'm really trying to say is that I, I think Congress, um, as, you, as you think about how COPPA might be changed today, I mean, we, we haven't talked about this, but the Obama administration, of course, tried to, to do um, a national uh, comprehensive uh, privacy legislation. Um, this current administration is trying to launch something similar, and it's possible that a rethink of COPPA might be part of that, particularly because, as we'll discuss later, the Europeans have taken a somewhat different approach. We now have some state laws. So the, all these questions are starting to come up again. And, and I think what I would say to, if I could take a time machine back to 1998, to legislators, I, I might have said something to them like, um, okay, so I understand you might be concerned about marketing, but you might want to have a different um, framework for dealing with those. And, and Congress didn't. So I'm just trying to make the point that um, COPPA covers all of this stuff, with a range of, of things that are clearly very harmful to things where the harm is, is either non-existent or, or very theoretical, and one might want a different approach in dealing with those categories. And, and let me add, um, as I recall, it might not be reflected in the legislative history, which, as I remember, is pretty thin. It, it is. Actually. <laughs> it, it really is. <laughs> it's not, you know, yeah. it's not all that deep, um, because there was just such widespread rep you know, support. But the FTC report that went along with the hearings and the ultimate passage did highlight particular online activities that were problematic that weren't just physical safety related. Um, as Jim said, the, um, the typical website at the time was static. You had a child typing inputs into open fields, but the types of fields that were observed in a, in, in a surf that the FTC staff did to support the report were kind of the Hoover vacuuming up of information about a child and her family that really had nothing to do with physical abduction and much more about building a profile of what that particular household looked like, almost like a census. You know, how much does your father make? How much does your mother make? What kind of car do your parents drive? What income levels are they at? And so that existed at the time as well. And I think probably most of us in the room would think, oh, I don't like that, right? Now, if you fast forward to online behavioral tracking and cross-platform marketing, that may be a different issue, also covered by the current COPPA, but what was happening even back then were that marketers were realizing that they kind of had a spigot you know, into a child's household that they could just turn on because the kid really wanted to get to the game that was at the end of that open text questionnaire. So it was rudimentary. It wasn't necessarily the same kinds of techniques that are, that are happening now. But even in the statement of basis and purpose, which is you know, the long text narrative that explains the commission's thinking at a time when they issue a rule, which came out in 1999, there was talk of marketing techniques and advertising networks. And, and so you know, the predation issue was one part, but not, I would say, even primary in right. COPPA as it was enacted. Uh, I, I just have one last thing about this, which is simply that uh, predation is, is clearly unambiguously awful. So right. in, in legal 
regulatory theory, you think about you know per se rules versus rules of reason, right? So when it comes to naked price fixing or um, you know actual cartelization, right? We just ban those outright. Similarly, no one wants to have any possibility that their child is is abducted. But then there are some other areas where it's the, there's, there are trade offs, right? And so, for example. I, I uh, always remember the example that someone gave me of a, of a website that um, uh, targeted was, you know, basically about how kids deal with their dads, and the, so the subject matter of the page was about dads. That was a big keyword that was showing up, and it was I think it was for younger girls who were trying to find information about that. Well, after the rule change, because the it was made very difficult to do behaviorally targeted ads where you would profile um, someone to, so you'd kind of deduce that they might be a child without really getting information about them that allows you to specifically target them. That, that website abandoned what's called behavioral uh, advertising and they relied instead on contextual advertising. And contextual advertising is a pretty terribly blunt tool and all the contextual advertising had to go on on that particular page was that the word dads appeared a lot. And so what, what kind of ads did they show on that page? They showed ads that were about um, you know, how to deal with, with deadbeat dads who weren't paying child support. <laughs> now this is a, it's a right. sort of funny slash sad example, but it simply illustrates that um, in that category, that there is a real trade-off. So not only in that particular example were the ads clearly worse and, and maybe even harmful to children because they might have raised some very awkward questions, but the, think about what that says about that particular site and the larger ecosystem, that you've, you've got a bunch of publishers who are trying to fund their content for kids who were reliant upon advertising, who found that their model for more profitable ads wasn't working. They perhaps tried to do contextual ads. They probably found that those weren't going to work. And then a lot of them probably either decided to start charging money or exited the marketplace, which, which might perhaps be some small part of why the commission's been getting less questions. There are probably fewer players out there since the rule was changed, and, and maybe we can hear more about that. But I'm just trying to illustrate that there are some hard questions we have to deal with about these uh, trade-offs. And in an ideal world, we'd have different frameworks for dealing with the ha clearly harmful stuff and then the stuff that's more um, ambiguous. Well, I'll say one thing about that, and then I want to hear, I think, from Sarah, because I think she's probably got a lot to say. Um, so there were always is this idea that kind of COPPA killed the internet, or did COPPA kill the internet, or will COPPA kill the internet for kids? And so, um, you know, yeah. it would be very interesting to hear from Sarah as you were guiding apps, because we definitely heard that mm -hmm. in the rule review, yes. that you're going to put too stringent a uh, set of criteria around small actors, that you're going to drive them out of the marketplace. And yeah. has that happened? Yeah, so, so I think... I think I don't want to generalize and say uh, that COPPA drove everyone out, but you do see today that there are less um, independent players in the kids space than you, than you saw even in 2011. Um, I think that um, either they have been bought up by larger companies, or you are seeing them just sort of go away because it's just, it's a, it's, it's a lot of work to be to work on the internet. Um, uh, the they especially in the app space, um, there was an explosion of apps when the iPhone launched and the iPad launched, and there's some great um, robust um, sort of there was you could be a small app developer and launch something and find some really great success, um, but you don't get to compete in the way that the general audience apps do. Um, you, you, have to, you have to make sure that you're doing things right on privacy. You also have to make sure that you're doing things right just generally providing kids a safe, and, um, uh, a safe experience online. Um, so figuring out how to do that is hard and figuring out how to stay in that without sort of the advertising capabilities that you have um, even when you're in the late teen space, um, it's a little bit different. Um, but I, it, I will say, I, I did, I had a conversation with a friend recently who was trying to start up a program um, for tweens, tween girls. And um, there was going to be, it, it's a cool, it's, it's not even online, but the, it would be an actual physical thing, but they were going to have these tween girls sign up online through a, through a service. And they couldn't figure out how to do it for the 11 and 12 year olds. So they're just like, well, 
we aren't going to include the 11 and 12 year olds. We're gonna, just going to do the 13 year olds because it's, it was it was a for profit, but it was a for profit that didn't have a lot of money to hire a Phyllis. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so they just decided not to do it. Um, and that's, that's too bad because the program would have been really cool, but they just didn't want to deal with the compliance. And I think you see that a lot, um, where people will just be like, well, it, it's 13, so we're just going to do 13 and up. Yeah, I, one thing I would add that as a software guy is this is at the same, you're seeing uh, companies exit the, the kids' marketplace at the same time as, as you're seeing tools coming online that, that allow people to create apps and create, especially games, much quicker, much cheaper. I mean, you were really back to the garage days where three guys in a garage can, can really do, a, excuse my French, a kick-ass game. Um, and I'm, I'm quite sure because I have plenty of clients who basically just said, we're not going to do a kid's game. We would love to do a kid's game, but we just we can't put up with that that compliance, and you know, and and if that's the trade-off we decide we have to make, that's fine. But we've got to be cognizant of that at the same time. Well, and you'll have kids sign up for products that they shouldn't be signing up for. I haven't I haven't looked at um, Fortnite and seen if they get verifiable parental consent. Somebody that is deep within that can probably tell me if they do. But I, I, I'm pretty sure they, they age gated 13. Yeah. 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 Whether they get it right is a, right. They but you have their software. you do have you do have you probably do have 11 and 12 year olds on that. I, I just want to say in the commission's defense here. It's really hard to measure this problem. I mean, yeah. these stories. As I'm sure you you sit here and you think, well, these sound very anecdotal, and they are. It's hard to collect data. It's hard to know what the real costs and and trade offs are. And um, so I, I, it's not like the, there's a magic way for the commission to perfectly measure exactly what's going to happen in the real world. What, what I will say, though, is that the, the way that we currently measure regulatory impact across the board, having nothing to do with the commission in particular, or COP in particular, uh, I, I think clearly misses the, the point. So we, when, we, when you read a regulation uh, of any kind, you go to the end and you see, well, how many man hours is it estimated that this will take, right? And that's really the wrong measure, because the right measure is really, what does what that translate into into real world effects? And in even a fairly small number of, of man hours or, or, or time or cost, when applied to an area where profit margins are very thin, where people are going into it because they, they just they care about the area, and they're not really trying to make money, but they have to be able to pay their, their basic bills, or where they don't have lawyers and they're doing something that's more informal, even small costs can make a big difference. And I, I, I don't know exactly what to say that the commission should do with that, except, except to try to be very cognizant of that, that impact on people in the real world. But you, you well, have to deal with this or had to. So. Well, and, and, but on both sides of the, of the coin now. And in fact, a mentor of mine who had left the FTC before me um, and before we issued the revised rules said, ha, 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 good luck now that you're going into the private sector because you're going to have to implement what you wrought. And so, you know, maybe the last laugh was on him or me or however you say that. Um, but, you know, one of the meta trade-offs that I think Congress made, whether you agree with it or not in implementation, is that it's going to sound naive, I'm just going to throw it out there, is that this is a consent statute. So it doesn't ban the activity. It doesn't ban the collection. It, again, naively or not, seeks to insert a parent in the process prior to the child's engagement. And that sounds kind of simple, right? So you put this roadblock hurdle and then assuming you fully disclose to the parent what your information collection practices are, and you do that in a way that's clear so the parent kind of gets it and they get it before the kid can push, sign me up, then you can do, you can engage freely with the child all you want to. So, so in the perfect world, it is a sunlight, full mm -hmm. notification, informed consent statute, off you go. So I think that is where the trade-off was probably made. Not banning particular kinds of activity, not even setting um, threshold levels under which a kid can't engage, over which a kid can, even parsing out, Baron, what you said, this kind of consent or path for marketing, this kind of consent for potential meeting up with a child in the real world. Um, 
no, just get the parent in there, get the parent informed, and then let the kid go on their way. Now, what that ignores is a whole bunch of things, mm-hmm. right? It ignores that parents don't really necessarily want to be um, fully informed. They just want to hit, like, yes, 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 your your granddaughter, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like, she just wants to play the darn game, and your daughter mm-hmm. just wants to give her the tablet right. so that mm-hmm. she can, you know, go away for a little while. Um, so you have that as a reality. It also ignores the fact that we have relatively blunt instruments for knowing who's who on the internet. And mm-hmm. so, you know, forever people have talked about the fact that in COPPA's categories, if a kid says that they're 13 and older, they get to get on without all of these well-thought-out consent mechanisms designed for children 12 years old and younger. But if you step back from kind of at at the stage at which Congress was when they developed the statute, they were thinking, we've got kind of an elegant solution here. That's me being an originalist. Uh, yeah, no, and I think I think this is getting back to the how COPPA has changed over the twenty the past twenty years. Um, I was in high school when it passed. Um, yes, I was in high school. So we had one computer. Sorry, <laughs> Why was it? Sorry. Um, uh, we had one computer in my household. Yeah. And my parents knew exactly what we were doing at all times. The computer was actually in their bedroom because the bedroom was also the office, and that's where it was. So they knew everything that was going on. And now, all I could just any kid could just take my device and do what they. I mean, my two and a half year old niece will fluently be able to make her way through my device, and she doesn't have a lot of access to that. So it's a sort of uh, consent is different. The consent process and how it works in reality is a lot different today than it was in 1998 or when it went into effect in 2000. If I could just add, so again, I don't think it's, I'm not going to do like a policy defense of COP. I think Congress and the commission made the decisions it made. But I think, again, if we kind of look at those decisions with hindsight, um, you know, I think the commission in 2013 said, okay, well, we are, you know, we are mindful of kind of not killing the market for kids, so we're going to do all these things, and um, you know, um, we have the mixed audience, which I can get into, but we have the mixed audience issue. We have the kind of, um, you know, it's support for internal operations where you can use persistent identifier. We have the original rule, which allows an email plus me- method of consent, which is a, an easier form of consent for only first party collection that's not shared with third parties. So I think. I think the commission and Congress thought that they were making these trade-offs, and I think if I had to look back, I think they also thought that with innovation in the marketplace, there may be easier methods for VPC, mm-hmm. for verifiable parental consent, that come online. But I think just as a staff person at the FTC, I don't view my role you know, today to kind of defend the policy decisions that were made. I, th- I view my role as this is the law this is the, that Congress gave us, this is the rule that commission implemented the law through, and it is my job to enforce that rule because you know people are, are abiding by it, people are trying to abide by mm-hmm. it, and so our job is to take those competitors who are not abiding by it and to bring cases. And so, um, so in a way, you know, of course, this is this is important to think about the policy decisions and to continue to think about the policy decisions. But as a, as a staff person at the FTC, my main role is to make sure that we're enforcing the rule equally across the board. So, so I do want to move on to now mm-hmm. to co-viewing and, and, and multi-generational and 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 especially in the the context context of, of the term directed at children. You know, what does that mean? And especially what does that mean for large social media sites? Um, I think we sort of view that as, as one of the big frontiers um, that the FTC is going to have to deal with. And, and I really would like to sort of you know, open that up for, for, for discussion of um, how, how do these large, you know, how, how does a YouTube that gets how many hours a second of new video go up on, on, on YouTube, but they, I forget what the name is, it's like 300 hours every second goes up. Um, and, and so how are we going to deal with that in that environment, especially when there are all these you know, millions of sub-channels um, that people are, 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 are either directing to, to families or directing to parents, but that has kid contents, or they're directing at kids. I mean, how are, are, are we going to have to redefine what directed to means, or can we just sort of fall back on, we know it when we see it, but now you're in an enforcement context, oh my God, you know, I've got to hire a lawyer now. So, 
Well, well, this is where those those policy questions try to uh, reassert themselves because the commission has discretion uh, to decide some of these questions, and inevitably they're 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 not simply implementing the clear will of Congress because Congress's intention isn't clear, and 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 I, to be fair to the commission, we have to understand that they. They're in a difficult position, in, in, and they're being confronted directly with these questions. So if you look, for example, at the complaint that the Center for uh, Digital Democracy um, filed, um, they, you know, I'll give them credit, they, um, they ask a lot of the right questions. I think I would certainly disagree with them about the answers, but, but they're, they're focusing on the rise of platforms, and that complaint is focused on, on YouTube. Uh, and they ask questions like, all right, well, um, you know, YouTube's huge, right? But then there are areas of YouTube where you have particular channels, uh, and some of those channels might be uh, directed to children. Um, then there are the things that Google does that semi-curate content, right? So there are um, areas where there's a, uh, an area that, that profiles uh, collections of, of channels. And that raises a different question, which is um, th those, the way that Google describes those, I, I think, is directed towards families. It's it's geared towards parents who I think, as I look at it, who are navigating the site and who are um, looking for stuff that they can watch with their children. And I, I realize we, this is a little bit awkward for Manisha because she can't comment on a pending investigation. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, 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 she's got a poker face. I'm just keeping my mouth shut. You don't, you don't have to say. say you don't have to say anything. anything. Well, I'm, didn't turn her mic off. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm simply pointing out that. These, these, are not, these are not theoretical questions, right? The commission's being confronted with these questions, which um, in turn ultimately come down to what kind of duty does a platform have to monitor what goes on on its site? And, and you, know, what, you, know, you noted earlier, you said there were three categories of sites that are, are, are circumstances where sites are covered. One, if, they're, if the site is directed to children. Two, if the site has actual knowledge that a person is a child. Or three, if there's a third party that has actual knowledge that another party in that chain um, is directed at children. And that's um, it's all very well and good on paper, but it's going to be very unclear in many circumstances what that means. So when we talk about getting more guidance from the commission, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. So um, without asking you to comment on a particular case, if you can speak just generally might be helpful, and if you can't I understand, we can talk about this. But if we could just all talk about what, how we will think about how to, how to answer those questions, what what sources of guidance or decisions we should look at thus far, that would help us understand how the commission is going to apply the discretion it has. Uh, so, okay, so l let me just answer it this way. So, obviously, I cannot talk about um, any specific companies, uh, but in terms of kind of. Um, you know, let's take another example where there's like a, uh, a marketer of a tablet that has an app. So, so you can think of a lot of situations where there's multiple parties in a transaction and kind of what's the liability of each party and what's, you know, and, 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 and this sounds like a punt, but it's really going to depend on the facts and circumstances. I mean, you might have some business models where, you know, um, an, an app is, you know, um, acting at the behest of the device owner or they're kind of intertwined or related or have some sort of partnership, and we would look to see, you know, who is the operator in that circumstance. Um, you might have kind of completely separate actors, and then we might look to see kind of who has no actual knowledge of what's collected. Again, you know, I can't comment on a specific fact pattern, and it's hard to generalize, so I'm going to just kick it over to the other <laughs> panelists. Well, you asked kind of where people should look, and, you know, there's kind of the people who are in the know, and then there's maybe people who should be in the know. And I'm going to make a very specific suggestion to Manisha, um, and then talk more generally. Um, those of us, you know, there's a relatively small body of documents that make up what you should be looking at if you're a COPPA thinker. Um, but I think probably the general public or the general public that thinks about this would go straight to the FAQ. So my suggestion would be, if you guys are going forward, to pull more of your other articulations into the FAQs and link to them so that people don't have to be, you know, someone like mm -hmm. me who knows, oh, go to the statement of basis and purpose and then look at their business guidance and then, you know, just to have a one-stop clearinghouse um, from which people can go. That having been said, you know, there 
has been in the past an articulation about platforms. It came out of the statement of basis and purpose in the 2012 rule. Um, there was kind of a clear cut line drawn then mm -hmm. that the platforms would be off the hook and that the operators of the particular sites and services on those platforms were going to be on the hook. So you had the games that were operating in the App Store, for example, that would be responsible for compliance because they were having the one-on-one -on -one relationship with the kid who was going to play in the game, but that the Google Play or the Apple App Store or, you know, maybe the gaming platforms, they could, if they were so inclined, develop a consent mechanism that would cover everything that happened on that platform, but they didn't have to. Um, and that may be changing, you know, based on the question that you outlined, Baron, you know, or based on the petition that came through, which pointed out that there might be more curation happening um, to direct families right to the appropriate parts of that much broader platform, or maybe, as you said, Manisha, an interrelationship between the platform and the games that are appearing on the platform so that maybe in the future the analysis would look a little different. Yeah, and I think I think on that I was going to say the, the 2012, um, there was a lot of discussion about yeah. where platforms fell in 2012. Um, I think you did that in both iterations of the, both, both um, the NPRM and the SNPRM. I think there was discussion. Oh, we got into it. the weeds with those uh, acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but I I also think on the merits of the actual case. I I'm not there. I can talk about it. Um, uh, I think that the complaint file brings up some novel questions, and I think it is worth um, that we probably didn't discuss in 2012. And I think it would be worthwhile to look towards figuring out if the FTC can provide some guidance on how companies that are working in this space would need to protect student privacy in these, or student privacy, my other word, <laughs> <laughs> children's, privacy, children's privacy in these cases. Because these are new, new questions that didn't come up before, and there isn't really any sort of clear way to think about well, them. And it's, it's not just them bringing this up. I mean, I, I asked my question really in the context of the larger landscape, where every day now, I mean, Facebook's earnings are down 20% mm -hmm. as of the earnings announcement this morning. And that's some indication of the way in which the political discourse in Washington about intermediary um, responsibility is, is, is really changing the, the landscape out in Silicon Valley. I mean, we've spent the last year trying to defend Section 230, which, as you probably all know, was, was amended for the first time um, to, um, to deal with uh, sex trafficking in a way that I think actually was totally unnecessary. I think the real answer was a criminal statute. There was part of that bill, but there was another part that was uh, rolled into that. And, and that's just one example. Uh, there's a larger conversation going on right now about the responsibility of platforms to identify foreign actors and election interference and fake news and to be politically neutral. And, and as we look forward, uh, um, since we're now 20 years out and it's been five years since we did our last panel, I, I have to say I think the next five years, whatever happens exactly, is going to involve a lot more focus on, on platforms being held responsible whether it's legally or simply by browbeating in congressional hearings. And, and, and so there's, there's COP as it is now, and then there's the, the growing expectation among politicians that platforms should be re held responsible no matter what. No matter even if you know, Facebook might accept a responsibility to do X that might become the expectation, where may, may, maybe Facebook, maybe they could implement that. But a lot of other players couldn't. Well, I read yesterday or the day before that Facebook has announced that it's going to start voluntarily looking for and kicking off underage users, which, you know, was prompted by something because they've been around for quite a while. And the bright line articulation under the rule is if you don't have actual knowledge, you don't have actual knowledge. You can get it, as Manisha said, in a variety of ways, but you don't have to go out looking for and, it. So can I, this is such an important example. So let's just tease this out. Just think through your example just for a moment. So Facebook starts that, right? So now everyone expects that you have a duty. You don't actually have a legal duty to actually go out and actively look. But, but if Facebook does it, you know, other sites are going to be uh, held to, to, to the same standard. And then the problem is that you know, the more you look, the more you're going to get 
actual knowledge. And so, you know, that, that which was not part of Congress's intention by design, I think wisely so, going down that road, that's the sort of scenario where the problem for smaller sites becomes unmanageable. Where at that point they say, you know, look, if we're going to get dragged through congressional hearings and so on because we don't actively, affirmatively look, um, you know, if, if we were to start doing that, then we would wind up with a lot more actual knowledge and potential legal liability, and we just don't want to deal with that. that that's the kind of cascade effect that, you know, is, it's not, it's not COPPA's fault, it's not Congress's fault for what they did, it's just the way that these, this law and the circumstance is evolving, it, it could end up being a lot more um, tending to, to force consolidation in the business, tending to make it difficult for small and, and startup companies to do things. And I just think we have to be honest and realistic about that and then ask how do we, A, get clear guidance from the commission so the commission can do its part to make clear its own e expectations, and then to be very wary about a political push, which could come from any quarter now politically. You never know when something might change to shift the law beyond what the statute or the rules actually cover. Oh, actually, let me just, uh, I, I, I'm genuinely curious. So, um, so if Facebook says, you know, we know the law doesn't require this, but we want to do it as a service for our customers or in response to political pressure, but they say they'll do it in service of their customers. Um, is that something you think should be discouraged because you're worried that other no. people in the marketplace will do that? No, no, I want to be really clear about this. Okay. I, I think 230 got this balance right. I believe that, you know, websites should be good Samaritans and they may have a moral duty to do certain things like combating sex trafficking, for example, right? So I absolutely would never say that we should discourage sites from, from doing the right thing. I'm, I'm trying to make a different point, which is just that when we instead have um, a, the sort of circus that we've seen on the Hill where politicians use their power to, to the technical term in the academic literature is jawbone, mm -hmm. which is to say you, you effectively exert regulatory effect without actually passing a law or, or doing something formal, that makes me very uncomfortable. And remember, I come at all of this from a First Amendment per starting place. Mm -hmm. And, and if the, the history of the First Amendment and of the regulation of speech in this country is full of examples of, of that kind of jawboning. And we, we've had I examples of industry codes of conduct, that the Hayes Code in the early days of the movies. You know, those were all just, um, they were extracted from industry by well-connected politicians who knew how to, how to drive political spectacle. And we're, we live in the age of demagogues and of, of media that, that are conducive to that. And that's, it's just a reality we have to, to deal with, and it's not the commission's fault, but they are operating in that ecosystem. And I think perhaps, uh, perhaps my point is, A, we should listen very carefully and be wary of what happens on the Hill, but B, it's all the more reason for the commission to be more clear and specific about mm -hmm. its guidance, because I think in a way that, that protects the commission and this body of law from, from being warped in ways that um, start to become more uh, unintentionally problematic. Baron, I, I want to slingshot off that a little bit in, to, to the statement that you made that I think is really important, and that is um, if Facebook does something like this, does it become then sort, sort of a, an industry norm? Um, and if it becomes an industry norm, is one of the reasons Facebook could do this simply because it's got the ability, it's got the, the deep pockets to be able to do this, knowing that if this becomes an industry norm, they've essentially entrenched themselves and made sure that the, that the next great um, uh, platform can't come into existence because the hurdle is now so high. Uh, because of these industry norms that, that, that have now crossed well, just, up. Just look at the Honest Ads Act. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing a lot of other context here mm -hmm. to the discussion, but there are just other examples where the same basic pattern has played out where big players, it's not, it's not just Facebook, and other mm -hmm. people have been in this situation historically, but they, they decide that they can um, accept something. They, maybe they want to keep from being it being imposed as a legal requirement, because it's one thing to say you're going to do something. If you don't have a legal responsibility to do so, you're not legally liable yet, but when they say they do that, it, it does create that dynamic, that expectation for for others, and you know, what, what it really comes down to is things like, you know, you talked about acts members. Well, if you go to an investor, and the investor says, well, gosh, you know, a, a big players are doing X, Y, and Z. Are you, are you doing those things? I'm not sure I want to be associated with a company that's doing those. That is a real part of the dynamic of how this ecosystem operates. So, that, that's all I'm saying. Well, one thing I think we're ignoring, but I know we're getting there, but I think that also is putting a lot of pressure on 
on platforms specifically is what's happening in Europe. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. the law is yeah. so completely different from what was established in the United States. Right away, these platform um, and big property actors who had a measure of comfort in the United States that they could comply in particular ways, they knew kind of which side of those three buckets they fell into. All of that goes out the way, out the window in Europe. There is a different definition of to whom um, they call them information society services. We call them online services here. Um, you got to figure out if you if it applies to you there. The age criteria are all over the map. There are maybe four different age levels that different member companies have decided at their discretion to enact member countries uh, member yeah. cu- countries right yeah. and um, you and then the compliance issues are totally different you have to get consent from the kid you have to figure out what whether they're of the age of consent if not then you have to get consent from the parent so um, it's possible that you know our pokey little law here <laughs> is not what's driving the train at all or cre- going to create incentives in the future. And so some major companies, yep. I think, are just going to look across the board and say, whatever we comply with in Europe, we're going to bring to the United States, too, because it's just too complicated not to. Right. And I think that raises the kind of competition point that Barron uh, mentioned, which I know that, you know, commissioners at the FTC are concerned about. You know, I think we want to wait and see how GDPR plays out. But, um, you know, we have these very large firms um, that are saying we're going to comply with GDPR across the board, and, and they can't afford to do that because they have systems in place. And so, um, so I think it remains to be seen how the smaller players or medium-sized players will fare. And thanks for my segue for me, because we do want to turn to that and, and, and in two aspects. One is, um, is 13 the right age? Um, that's what our statute says, but obviously GDPR is different. Um, we've now got a California uh, privacy law that, that, that has a different age to it. Um, is it time to, to, to look at that again? Is there any differences in the literature? Um, I'm not seeing any. Uh, I don't do this on a daily basis, but, but I represent... You know, a company that, that does the majority of, uh, of educational programming for commercial television, um, they can't find any studies that, that, that say that children are somehow less able to distinguish between advertising and content and, and programming content today. Um, but we need to have that discussion, if for no other reason, by it's being forced upon us externally. <laughs> and so um, what do you think? Are we going to hold the line on 13, or, or you know, are, are we facing a, a, an upward shift of that? Well, uh, this is my particular um, focus in this area, so I'll just say that, um, one, um, I'm not a social scientist, obviously, so I'm not, I'm not qualified to comment on the literature, but I'm not aware that there's any, been any real shift in that. But I actually don't think that's the most important part of this analysis. I, mean, I think the reason that Congress um, was correct in rejecting the 13 to 16 category, which was a part of, that's the one thing in COPPA that actually did change and on which there is some some legislative history because that that was actually modified. I think they were right to reject that because what what you know rewind to the beginning to the introduction that Manisha gave us here to think about how the commission understands when a site is directed at children. If you're doing it based on subjective factors, you know those factors work reasonably well when you're talking about kids under 13. The, the use of cartoons, the, you, know, you know when you see it. I, I, I think that's a workable approach. That becomes a lot harder when you start talking about um, slightly older children because the, they're, they're becoming more like slightly older children. And the, the Venn diagrams start to expand dramatically and you start to wind up in a situation where you, if we were to ask, well, is this a, is this a tween-directed site? You're going to sweep in a lot more older users. The effects of COPPA are therefore no longer so uh, focused and, and, and limited to the area where the, the interests, whether it's for predation or marketing, are, are strongest. In other words, I, I think this is the thing that has made COPPA workable to the extent that, that, that it is, and despite the, the problems that it, it has created. Um, and, and then you get to the empirical assessments. The commission has asked questions about uh, per, you know, percentage share and, and so on. And I think those all, you know, you, you're inevitably, and I'm just looking back at our paper we did in 2009, but you, you inevitably are going to have a lot of younger users on the most popular sites because they're the early adopters, right? Think about 
I still don't understand Snapchat. I just don't get it. <laughs> but but the percentage of you know people in their twenties now who use it is growing. And if 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 we had a world where COPPA applied to thirteen to sixteen year olds, you know Snapchat might very well have been subject to that, and it may never have gotten off the ground or never achieved scale or. Just, it, that's the kind of real-world effect we could see if COPPA were expanded beyond its current scope. Well, and so now you have a test case because I think those are the very sites that guided the EU in, in formulating their law. You know, their the rule is offered to, offered directly. I think is the language mm-hmm. in the GDPR offered directly to children, and that is not designed for children. That is, can kids get on as among other people who can get on and aren't blocked at age 18 with an age gate for mature audience sites. So there you have it. You know, we'll see what happens there. And some of the member countries have 13 as their cutoff, and others have 16, and some have 14, and some have 15. And, and here's, so here's the final thing I'd say about this. Remember, the big problem here is the kids lie, and the older they get, the more likely they are to lie. And if you wind up in a scenario where kids, you know, um, want to get access to that slightly older content and just lie in order to, to do so, you know, the, you could, the commission could say, well, come on, you know, you should be doing more to, to, to restrict them from accessing that content. And eventually you wind up in a scenario where you have, you have COPA, where you are effectively age verifying all users of, of what is effectively a largely general audience site in order to access that underlying content. In the United States, that raises very real, clear, demonstrated First Amendment problems in the uh, case law because we have a a right as adults to access content anonymously and not to have to verify our identity or go through other hoops. In Europe, that doesn't exist. So it may well be that those sorts of requirements could withstand judicial scrutiny there. I don't think they would in the United States. And I think something important to consider when we're talking about ages of kids is um, kids kids are gonna kids can read when they're twelve and thirteen and fourteen and fifteen and sixteen and they might want information that they might not be able to access um, in their school or in their home and figuring out how to get that ac- access you think of a kid that wants to learn more about. The Bible and doesn't have doesn't that isn't something that they access in their school or their family or or, or, the, gay or, kids. or an LGBT student or a child that wants to find out more information about it. Figuring out how to make sure that kids that want to learn more about who they who they are um, in a safe space, um, I think, is a balance that needs to be struck um, because it's something it's something that one of the benefits of the internet is that we can learn about a lot of stuff. And being able to provide everyone equal, equitable access to find out that information is, I think, very important. And and there is First Amendment case law on this, on the the First Amendment rights of juveniles. And I was going to say, I agree with everything that's been said, and this is my personal view. I don't think 13 to 16 is is workable. And it's funny, I have a 14-year-old, and a couple years ago I used to say, well, you know, I respect my teens' privacy, and I'm not sure I'm going to use that argument anymore, but, <laughs> but uh, no, no, but I, I do respect his privacy um, and, and his ability to kind of, you know, search for things, and, um, and also I think that just as a practical matter, you know, he, he's much more savvy than I am, so short of kind of requiring ver- verifiable parental consent in the form of a Skype call or something, you know, he could easily impersonate me, so, um, so anyway, so I just, um, I, I think it's unworkable. But, you know, the flip question is also kind of interesting. Um, should COPPA's age be lowered, mm-hmm. right? I mean, right. you've got more and more savvy kids at younger and younger ages. It used to be that we could make an assumption that if someone had entered a particular date of birth that made them, I don't know, five or six, they probably were doing that with a parent in the know. Um, And you asked about co-operators, and we used to call it lapware, where the kid is on your lap. I mean, younger and younger kids know exactly how to navigate to the content that they want. I mean, you can give a baby an iPhone, and they're doing this. Like, Mm -hmm. they know if they wave their finger, something is going to happen that's going to give them that little adrenaline Mm -hmm. bump, you know, Mm -hmm. later. So, um, you know, how young is so young that a parent is likely to be involved versus... There's no, there's no parent in the room. Anyway, 
I just threw that out. That's not an answer for anything. But. And I, I would just say, I don't think Congress was attempting to um, interfere with scenarios where the parent was already working with the child. Yeah or to make those more difficult or cumbersome. But we have a very interesting, we haven't talked at all about the Internet of Things, but there's a very interesting question that I've been pondering, um, which is connected devices that are developed for a parent to track a child. So you no longer in that scenario have a situation where a kid is going to go off and access stuff online without a parent involved. In fact, these devices and others are being marketed so that the parent can pull personal information from a child, maybe without the child's consent at all. So that's that's kind of an interesting category where, you know, you're of course you're dealing with a parent because no kid is going to want a geo tracker in their backpack. Right, but uh, but uh, what I would say to that is that I think that, you know, that the kind of notice and consent issues become less important in those scenarios. Mm -hmm. But even, you know, we, we sent out these warning letters to manufacturers of smartwatches, and I think the thing that I would be most concerned about on these, you know, devices that collect geolocation is security. Right. And right. so COPPA right. does have a reasonable right. security right. requirement, and I think we do want to make sure that these manufacturers are um, putting in reasonable security. How, how, can I just ask, how is that different from the reasonable security that everyone's supposed to have? <laughs> It is. Uh, it's in the rule. It, so it's in the rule, and we, right. get, and we get civil penalties right. for but, it. But, but in terms of the actual substantive requirement, is there a difference between the two? So, uh, so there is a difference in what we have to prove. So, in other words, you know, COPPA just says thou shall have reasonable security. So we get, you know, in a court, and we say, okay, we have an expert that says the security was unreasonable. If we go in under deception, we have right. to prove that there's a representation that it was material. So, so there's just different levels of proof and different remedies. Right. Well, uh, see, see our LabMD, et cetera, uh, other yeah. events, which yeah. we're not going to get into today. But, you know, you also have, is there a difference? Maybe yes, um, substantively, because reasonable security when you're dealing with the personal geolocation information of a child is different from geolocation information from an adult. So when you're going into court, yeah. it's probably a very easy case. No COPPA case has ever been litigated by the FTC, um, and a couple by the states, but very few. Um, but if you were to lay out that evidence to a judge, I'm sure you just would say, it's a kid. Yeah. The rule says you have to have reasonable security. They left the back door totally open in this device. Mm -hmm. Bam. <laughs> so we're, we're starting to get to the end. I, we do want to have some the whole time for questions. Yeah. But before we do, are there any other sort of technologies at the bleeding edge that we need to think about that, that are out there just over the horizon um, that we should be thinking about now before they come and smack us in the face. I mean, you talk a little bit about Internet of Things. Elf on the shelf. Elf on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that talking doll, right, mm -hmm. that Europe went crazy over. Mm -hmm. um, Elf on the shelf. <laughs> so I, I think in terms of new technologies that we're watching, certainly, you know, artificial intelligence and big data issues, and we are, uh, the commission is hosting a series of, um, of hearings uh, to, to kind of address new topics and areas, and artificial intelligence is one of them. So for our Tech Freedom Book Club, we'll read the, the Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age, where an AI essentially brings up a small girl and turns her into a superhero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. she got parental <laughs> consent from the parent robot. Uh, no parental consent was obtained. I don't want to give away too much, but no parental <laughs> consent was obtained. Others? Well, you know, one of the things that we had said when, when I was... Um, doing the rulemaking, and you have said since then, Manisha, in your business guidance, is that maybe to Barron's chagrin, it's a pretty flexible statute. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot built into those words. You know, online services was never defined. Internet was defined, but online services no. weren't. And so as new technologies emerged, the statute is kind of there to meet it. So um, there was business guidance that was put out maybe in 2016, where in one line, you know, the FTC said, of course this applies to the Internet of Things, yeah. right? And so it was just, it wasn't a surprise to yeah. me, yeah. but and, and not to you guys, but other people might have been like, it does, mm -hmm. you know? Where did that come from? Um, but we didn't have to anticipate what was next. I mean, at the point at which we were doing the rule review, apps that collected geolocation were it. You know, voice location, voice um, recordings made a lot of sense, but that was, you know, kids recording their voices in dancing videos or, you know, mm -hmm. um, voice-enabled search, 
obviously people in laboratories and otherwise knew about it, but it wasn't top of mind for us. And so um, COPPA is flexible enough to take those things into account, I think, without people having to know in this room right now, oh, after AI, it's going to be you know, a chip embedded in your brain. Well, Ph Phyllis, can I ask you a question before we turn to the audience? So setting aside whether that's the right approach for, for kids, given that there really is a very strong interest involved, what do you think the lesson is of, um, uh, of COPPA and its breadth and its flexibility and its vagueness um, in some of those key terms for how Congress should think about legislation around privacy and security overall? What, 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 what caution would you draw from the experience of COPPA for how to do broader legislation? Hmm. Um, I'm not going to, I don't know that I would draw a caution exactly. I'll turn it a little bit to Manisha where, you know, the FTC has been advocating for a long time for legislation around data breaches. Mm -hmm. um, I would assume that somewhere that legislation actually is drafted. And I will ask you, is it very specific? Is it, you know, are, is it scenario specific yeah. as opposed to broad brush? I mean, the reasonable security standard in COPPA, actually, it's kind of circular because it, that was in COPPA. Then the FTC drew on that when it talked about Section 5 and what reasonable security would mean. And then everyone goes back to COPPA. It's not really defined. It's just mm -hmm. there. So, you know. Do you have a cautionary tale on how specific I, I guess, things I should be? I, I guess I don't. I mean, I do think that um, as you know, there, if, you, if you're there's a spectrum, right? You could kind of have a statute that's so specific and so prescriptive that it's not going to allow the flexibility that you know companies need to innovate or you know to account for changes in technology and business models. Or you could have a statute that just says, and we delegate everything to the FTC or whatever agency. And I think the right place is somewhere in the middle. Um, and um, I do think there needs to be flexibility. I do think that, you know, to the extent that there's any legislation passed, there does need to be um, administrative rulemaking authority and, or APA rulemaking authority and the authority to seek civil penalties. But beyond that, um, it's a tough balance. And I think you're going to have people on both sides of the debate. Um, and, you know, I, I think COPPA probably, you know, got it on the margins right. Okay. On the, when I say on the margins, generally, yeah, yeah. On, along the spectrum, in yeah. the kind of middle. Well, if there are any journalists in the audience, that's what you should, should quote her on today. Right? <laughs> so, questions from the audience There's at this point. There's a journalist point. And there who has is, a question. And, uh, <laughs> there's a mic coming at you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Claude Martz with MWatch. I had a question from Anisha. What's what's next in terms of COPPA at the FTC? Or will there be additional, are, are you working at additional rules, additional other stuff? With, what would what were down the road? So I, I think that you know there are generally um, several enforcement actions, a, a at least a couple of enforcement actions uh, every year or two, and so I think that um, you could expect to see COPPA cases uh, soon. What about an articulation out of the uh, EdTech workshop? So the EdTech workshop we had in December, and I think that is something that we are you know we would like to provide additional guidance to industry. Um, as you know, the full commission has changed. So again, so I, th I would say stay tuned for that. Any idea what I mean, is it this year or next year? What, 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 what does that take? Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> Remember where you are. Soon is a relative <laughs> term in this town. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's okay. They're good for their word. And yeah. other com sometimes commissioners have said by the end of the year, and then like December thirty first year. It is. Yeah. So hopefully soon works. Yeah. Which year? Yeah. Other questions. Yes. Yeah. Over, all the way over here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Howard Feinberg with the Insights Association. So for, I guess, almost 12 years, we've been telling our members, even though they, they conduct marketing research and data analytics, not marketing, we've been telling them to follow the basic principles of COPPA in all their work online regardless and to try to figure out a way to apply those principles in the real world because we just accepted, well, this seems like a pretty fairly good approach. Um, I'm curious how other industries that you talk with have approached this sort of thing when they're not specifically doing marketing or not specifically doing the marketing online and how you expect that might change as they try to fumble around with GDPR like my members are trying to do right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I know that um, nonprofits are not subject to COPPA, but a lot of the nonprofits that I have talked to do rely on COPPA as sort of the the guidelines for how they build their technology. Um, 
just because a lot of the nonprofits that I talk to are often leaders in the space and um, know that other companies look to them. And uh, so you'll see a lot of um, nonprofit online, while well, they're online companies, will look towards Kappa as sort of the guideline. Well, and, and of course, if, if those companies are building a modern website, they're going to yeah. use uh, tools provided by for-profit companies. So COPPA is still implicated, even if the, the provider, the operator of the site is not directly covered. Right. Any other questions? I think we gave you a lot of information. Please <laughs> take some food on your way out. <laughs> and uh, we have more time in this space. So if you want to stay and ask a question privately or just network, feel free. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Oh, well, is that... Yeah. Is that the final word? Do you I, wanna... I think oh. that's it. Unless anybody else has a final word, I think that it that that's it. Um, could I can yeah. I just ask one really quick question? So if five we'll do another one. Final word. Five years from now, what do you think we'll be talking about uh, about Kappa in um, twenty twenty three? Well, let's ask the audience. <laughs> Anyone? I. Pardon. IoT. IoT. Yeah. Yeah. Be on IoT. Well, everything will have a sensor, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I actually think it's going to be more about the advertising, the monetization issue. Advertising being the sole way for a company to monetize right now. Is that the I think it's just going to get bigger. Uh, and I, I think, um, and this is my personal opinion, not my organization's opinion, but. Um, I think we will be having conversations on how COPPA interacts with um, other privacy laws. Um, and I think that conversations are happening right now um, in Congress and I know at the state level on how, I, we saw California. Yeah. Um, so how will, how does COPPA interact with that, um, which is, is specifically related to the California law, which is more strict, COPPA or, mm -hmm. or the California law? And um, how, do, how do companies comply with those new laws? Well, mark your calendars. We'll put it. We'll put it down. We'll do it. We'll do this one actually in September, which is the actual anniversary for 2023. <laughs> so stay tuned. Thank you for coming today. We'll put the video up online, and um, I just please join me in thanking our, our our lovely panel for their thoughtful comments. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in the fall. We'll be doing a, a small series of events around what the FTC is doing. We might have uh, Manisha or other guest stars from. The commission back, but um, in case, and I, I will plug something for you. I believe August twentieth is the deadline for yes. comments mm -hmm. on your workshop series. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I assume people have seen the announcement. There's uh, twelve topics, um, many of them related to competition on the consumer protection side. There's um, uh, there's kind of uh, two main topics. I would say three main topics. Three main topics on on the privacy side. One is um, privacy, big data, and competition. Second is remedial authority on uh, in privacy and data security for the commission, and the third is artificial intelligence and um, competition and consumer protection. So, so there'll be a series of workshops in the fall. One for each of these. So maybe combination to be determined. <laughs> okay. Well, it'll be um, workshop palooza at yes. the FTC. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll, we'll be commenting on that as well. Um, so please uh, just. Uh, come to those events and also remember we have our tech policy podcast hosted by our um, our own Ashkin Kazarian uh, who is not a Russian agent I assure you <laughs> uh, but anyway thank you all for coming and just joining me and giving a hand to our panel